Hello and welcome to the EDH RETCAST, where we're all about commander, data, and dad jokes. I'm Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, he's sad that the card King of the Oathbreakers cannot be his commander in the format called Oathbreaker. It's Matt Morgan. Joey, how many Reddit protesters does it take to change a light bulb? Oh no. No guesses? Fine. All right. Well, same as however many there are. Uh, none, because apparently Reddit protesters can't change anything. <laughs> Whoa! Wow! Is, does that, Matt, does that one count as a dad joke? I'm sure it does. I mean, I mean, if, if not, I mean, that's fine. If you'd rather be in the dark about the joke, that's fine. <laughs> Brutal. I, I'm brutal. I'm doing a very poor job creating a listening experience right now because my face <laughs> is just a giant like oh I'm like oh like oh man all right stunning work this week Matt holy wow it's very meta this week and and I'm sorry and or you're welcome <laughs> all right up next Legolas and Gimli may be counting their kills but little do they know he's got them both beat it's Dana Roach. Do you ever have one of those weird situations where, like, something you're sure you know winds up being incorrect? Hmm. Um, I had one of those this weekend. Like, I, I was sure that the first French fries were cooked in France, but it turns out they were cooked in Greece. Hmm. I'm pretty sure I've done that one before, but <laughs> it, it is tradition for you to steal one of my jokes every That's now for, and then. There we go, I guess, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's, like, it's just, just like, like segue, it's just like challenge the stats, which is happening right, right now. <laughs> hey, hey, no, 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 no. We are not going to challenge the stats just yet. That that does not count. Do not add it to the tally. All right, Matt, what are we actually talking about in this week's episode? <laughs> well, in case you folks haven't realized, uh, we are very, very excited about talking about Lord of the Rings. It's just an amazing set, at least for most of us. But we also want to talk about what makes commanders compelling. What makes us want to build these commanders, maybe from the set, but also just in general. Why do we pick the commanders we want to build? Yeah, yeah. There's been like how many new legendary creatures from this set? And I we've certainly not been able to stop talking about them. And I am curious to pick your guys' brain a little bit about what of these things, like what makes a card stand out from all of the others. And I think that could be a really fun academic exercise to get into. But before we get there, we got some shout outs to do. Yeah, first we want to thank Chase, also known as Mana Curves, for help editing the show. You can find them on Twitter at Mana Curves. And if you would like to support the show, you can do so by liking and subscribing this video on YouTube, subscribing on your local podcast app, or you can go to patreon.com slash EDHRETCAST, where you have patron tiers of all levels, where it's as little as $2 a month. You can join our Discord community. You can get access to challenge stats picks that we've done over the years. There's all that and more over at patreon.com slash EDHRETCAST. And there's always that tier where you get the weekly patron shout out. And this week, we want to give a very special thank you to Hannah Boss, who really bossed up <laughs> and joined our patron uh you're the boss like the the singer guy dana who is it <laughs> i have no idea what you're talking about the the, the boss the the oh the, bruce springsteen uh, yeah <laughs> See, you caught me off guard Han hannah bruce springsteen boss there we go thank you hannah i mean i just guarantee hannah boss's origin story is less problematic than hugo boss's origin story so um, congratulations hannah you're 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 the be the best of the bosses i we we are getting into some weeds not a horrible boss you might say <laughs> i this this might be the most convoluted way we've ever said thank <laughs> yeah. you to a patron ever hannah and that's saying I, something <laughs> right <th> yeah <laughs> And uh, uh, we really do appreciate your support. Thank you so much. We, it's very, very generous of you. This show would not happen without you. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, guys, are we willing to go into our topic now? Let's go into our topic now. I think we need to go into our topic now. Let's, let's well. focus on something that's, that's, that's germane to actually talking about the, the game of Commander. Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Um, yeah, so Matt, as you mentioned, Lord of the Rings hype is in the air. There are so many legends from this set, and a lot of them are really, really, really cool. But with so many new legends in the room, it does take something pretty special for a commander to actually stand out. And I guess I would like to know from you, like, first of all, is there a specific legend that you have in mind? insert tom bombadil here i'm very sure that yep you stole my that. stole stole my line but yeah that's fine <laughs> well but and also what is it about that commander that called out to you so so loudly i guess is like how do we let, let's get the topic started with what it is about that one 
Well, well, so Tom Bombadil, for those of you who don't know, is the, the new five color legend that is everything is new about sagas. So as long as there are four or more lore counters among sagas you control, Tom has Hexproof and Indestructible, which right there is pretty great. Mm. But then also, whenever you the final ability of a saga you control resolves, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal another saga card, put the card on the battlefield, and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order, and this only triggers once per turn. So... This opens up a strategy that we really haven't had a dedicated commander for. So I've had my Alila Art Artful Provocateur deck for a long time. And that's been my Saga Matters type of deck, where it's all about trying to get Sagas, triggering them, casting a Replenish or something like that to put them all back on the battlefield. And it really just unlocked a new strategy or gave us a fresh take on something, really, because we people kind of tried to make things work. But this really dialed in on something very, very specific, which... We, we see every now and then of a strategy is kind of there, but it doesn't have a dedicated commander for it. And Tom Bombadil fills that role just instantly. Well, specifically, there was Satsuki the Living Lore from uh, Kamigawa, mm. which could like add more lore count. But the thing is, it was only two colors. And you were like, no, I've got some blue sagas that I want to be playing. Yeah, th there's I've got lots of sagas I want to pl be playing. So I think it'd be fair to say that an important ingredient here is the color access is one of the most important things that made this commander appealing to you. It wasn't just, oh, it's a thing that does sagas. It's also like, I finally get to play sagas in the colors that I want to play them. Well, and it's not that I don't mind only playing Esper colors. I just don't love it. And also there were a ton of really good sagas that I just didn't have access to. So giving people access to something that it's been done in all five colors. So having a five color commander to fill that role really helps. It, it kind of opens up this whole new gateway of, of decks that people can be building. So for me, with Tom Bombadil specifically, I already had a deck that wanted to be a Tom deck. It just didn't have Tom Bombadil yet. So having it just giving a, a dedicated commander to really empower the strategy, that's what immediately for this specific example had me excited as soon as I saw the card. Yeah, I think something being new really is the biggest factor. L like, remember how for years they just kept printing Boros combat and equipment commanders? And, and like, no shade, those cards were good. Those commanders were good. They kept giving us a, a never-ending onslaught of more powerful commanders along that vein. But they all did the same thing. Like, even when they gave us Boros or Monowite commanders that could draw cards... That didn't move the needle as much either. Like Bell Borka from Commander Legends was kind of one of the first Boros Legends that provided a form of card advantage, and it's got fewer than 300 decks right now. Mangara the Diplomat also draws cards under 600. Heck, even Wyleth, like that's a commander that full on draws cards, but it's again an equipment strategy. It's an equipment commander, and it's less than half as popular as other commanders like Feather and Ozgear. So it wasn't about power. It wasn't about card draw. It was about getting something fresh. It was about novelty. It took stuff like Lorehold Ozgear doing artifact graveyardy stuff to finally shake things up. I think overall power can be an interesting thing that grabs attention at first, but the, the thing that makes you stay is the novelty. I think that's the most important ingredient. Yeah, I, I, I get that. The, the, the desire to have a commander um, direct you to brew a deck in a way that like nothing in those picker color combinations has, has let you brew before. That's a very attractive thing to a whole bunch of people too. Um, I, I absolutely get why like that thing like, oh, we've finally gotten our – X commander, um, particularly one in like colors that if I have colors in this case where you can do any of the things you want to do, um, that's really appealing to a lot of people. I think that's something you do hear a lot when a new set comes out and a card like this comes out that allows you to do a thing people have wanted to do for a long period of time. Um, I think that's something that, that, that maybe more than anything else that I hear from folks is what catches their eye regarding a commander is the ability to do a specific theme or strategy in a way that wasn't really able to be done before. I mean, I would instantly wager the next time we go back to Kaladesh, if there isn't a teamer colored energy matters type of commander, yeah, sure. I'm sure yeah. people would revolt because those are the colors that often had the best access to energy. Yep. And so that would just, it almost makes sense for it to be there. This is kind of what that's doing here in, in the Lord of the Rings set where, yeah, we just, we've wanted something that cares about sagas and now we finally have that. 
I, I think that's a really great observation. Also, it's funny that you mentioned revolt because revolt was also a keyword in the Kaladesh. Yeah, block, it wasn't just, a good one, though. <laughs> uh, no, that's very, very true. I think the uh, discussion there, I mean, you know, you mentioned Tom and that definitely unlocked something. And at the current time of recording, Tom is definitely the runaway commander, runaway favorite from the set. Almost 1700 decks to its name right now. And I imagine by the time this episode actually goes out, it's going to be way higher. So clearly this is a thing that a lot of folks have wanted. And you know what? Coming in in second place right behind it is another thing that does something similar. It unlocks a new uh, thing for a a certain type of strategy. Shelob Child of Ungoliant is the new spider demon that can take your opponent's stuff if your spiders deal damage to it and then turn it into food tokens. And those food tokens are so dang cool. I love that. But this is also doing a very similar thing. It's giving people who wanted to play a spider-focused deck a new avenue to do it. We already had Ishkanah, but this is a fresh take on it. So that fresh take is a really, really big factor that helps a thing be eye-catching. And we can literally see that in the data. And that brings me to Dana. Because Dana, <laughs> a thing that makes these commanders attractive to someone like Matt, and especially them being popular is I think a thing that makes you want to steer completely clear of them. And it's just very funny to me that something that makes a card eye-catching to one player can be anathema to another. Uh, yes, I mean, very much so. Although, don't get me wrong, I understand why these are attractive. And to go back to Shelob for just a minute before I, I talk about my favorite subject, which is me, um, <laughs> I, 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 like, I do get why that card is attractive, right? Like, it's it's powerful, and not only does it let you do a thing uh, um, very specifically, it's it's pretty open-ended too, unlike Tom. Like, Tom wants you to do that specific thing, mm. and I, I would guess there's not a lot of ways to take advantage of Tom um, that aren't that specific thing. I think that isn't really true of Shelob. I think you can just build it as a spider deck. I think you could maybe do it as a fight deck. Um, okay. I think there there's other ways to build this particular deck. I mean, there, there's no reason you couldn't take the shell of my Glissa Sunslayer deck and make sure of the commander of it with a, with a death touch theme. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with this deck. So like it's, it's giving you some build, it's giving you a build path, but it's giving you multiple ways to do that if you want to. And I think that's a really great design they don't hit very often where they mm. they there's a commander that suggests builds but it, but it suggests multiple builds and you're not necessarily wrong going any one of those directions i think that's a very difficult thing to do and i think shelob really hits that i love that great observation for sure yeah because tom does feel like I, I feel like if i do see one tom deck it will probably have quite a lot in common with another tom deck and you're right that shelob i could definitely see some very different avenues for it and, and that's only that, that's not a problem unless you're you know me right <laughs> like like <laughs> I, I, I don't think that's a necessarily a bad thing either. I, I just I really like it when they find a design like Shield that could go a whole bunch of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, um, for me personally, though, like I very much am looking at commanders as some kind of a like personal creative expression. So I want to be able to build a thing, but I want that thing to maybe not necessarily be the thing that everyone else is building. Um which is a really difficult thing to demand design do. <laughs> I'm asking design to give me cards that suggest a path or, or at least let me choose a path, but that path should be a, pa a path that other people aren't picking. Um, that it, I, my expectations for that are, are, are in check. I understand that that makes absolutely no <laughs> sense from a design perspective. Um, but it doesn't mean I, they, they don't accidentally do it sometimes. And, and I, I think if I wind up building a deck from this set and the, and the one I'm looking at right now is Arwen Mortal Queen, that would be the deck. Hmm. Um, Arwen's three mana for a 2-2. For a two -two. Um, when she ETBs, she comes in with an indestructible counter. And you can spend one mana to remove that indestructible counter from Arwen. And another target creature gets indestructible to end of turn. And then you put a plus one counter and a lifelink counter on both that creature um, and a plus one counter and a lifelink counter on Arwen. Um, so, you know, I look at that and I'm like, oh, that's probably instructing you to do things in general with counters mm. um, in green and white. I, my first thought when I saw it was, oh, I could try to build Selesnia Modular. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure, so okay. What I think I am going to try to do is mess around and try to build a Selesnia Modular deck. So it, it's a card that's, that, that's what catches my eye. It's giving me a build path, but it's letting me 
choose one that isn't super obvious. And I, I that's that to me makes it attractive. In fact, there's only 41 decks so far also makes it attractive. So it's, it's, it's letting me do a creative thing and it's letting me do a creative thing that not everyone else is doing. That's, that's something that's attractive to me. See, I thought you were going to say you were going to go the proliferate route by just making sure that you had a whole bunch of indestructible counters on R1 to hand out. So, and I, and I will probably that would be the sub theme because there's not a ton of, of of creatures that do have modular that are available to me in those colors. So, well, and you already have a you already have a Boros modular deck too, don't you? I do, but it's like a budget deck. It's not really one I play. It's like one I built out of just parts I had for you know right, fifteen dollars to fair to, fair. Yeah, so. Now, I, actually, I mean, that right there, you just hit on something else that I also think is like subconsciously it informs the, this stuff that like, oh, do I want to build something is like, do I already have some pieces for this that are just kind of lying around looking for a home? Right. Like, yeah, it, it, yeah that actually does kind of motivate me a little bit to be like, oh, you know what? You know, I could actually throw that together pretty easy. I probably only need to get like 10 extra cards for it. And this would be actually pretty easy to slap together and give it a try. And, you know, that can also be a, a very compelling thing. But I mean, it's just, it's very, very funny to me that you're most intrigued by like the 27th most popular commander from <laughs> from this set. Now, uh, what, I'm, what I'm less intrigued about is looking at it going, oh, I get to find another doubling season. Well, that'll be a, <laughs> that'll be a, Fun budget hit if I want to put a doubling season in there, so that's less exciting. But you know, so here's a hot take, Dana. You don't have to put <laughs> a doubling season in there. You don't have to 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 put those very expensive cards in there. <laughs> but I really want to, Matt. That's that's that, that's your prerogative. That 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 can be a really big thing too, though. Like you know, finding commanders that unlock the ability to not just play the famous staples. I feel I feel like that's a really strong one. Like sure, Dana. Clearly, a big motivating factor for you is like having a uniqueness. Like, do other people have this same deck? Is going to be a strong guide on whether or not. Like like if you are going to see the new Aragorn every night at game night already, you're going to be like, I'm probably not going to build a new Aragorn. Yes. But in addition to that, in addition to the commander uniqueness, you also don't necessarily want your 99 to look like anyone else's either mm -hmm. and a, a commander that encourages avoiding staples can also be a really big ingredient in that type of recipe well and so dana you you kind of danced around this question a little bit but i'll, I'll take a second to formally ask it to you two one thing that i know players really enjoy is some sort of deck building challenge and so sometimes people like the easy mode but sometimes commanders they can really spark a, a deck building challenge and, and how do you want to build it so that you're able to manage maybe two sides of the same coin? Do either of you kind of resonate with that of, and, and well, actually, no, sorry, Joey, I know Dana does, but Joey, do you enjoy <laughs> a challenging deck building process where you kind of have to problem solve in order to really figure out how to build the deck? Very much. Honestly, like uh, high key, I think that the tinkering with the deck and Matt, this is where you and I really differ. Tinkering with a deck is a thing that mm -hmm. makes it more compelling to me. Whereas I, I, I know that you really enjoy a deck where you can like you can build it and it doesn't feel like you need to constantly update it. You don't need to devote a, a bunch of extra mental energy to it every single set. Mm -hmm. For me, returning to a deck and re-experimenting with some stuff and trying slightly new tweaks here and there is a very fun part of the game. Not just the playing of it, but also the crafting of it is enjoyable to me. And in that type of vein, the challenge absolutely is huge for me. I, I want to feel like I'm the one playing a deck rather than the deck is playing me, if that makes any sense. the I, Having those challenges, having hoops that are a little bit difficult to jump through actually can be more engaging as a result. Yeah, I, I do agree with you on half of what you said, where <laughs> the, the deck building challenge and finding out what hoops you have to jump through are fun. But unlike you, I, I don't like solving a Rubik's Cube and then changing stickers around and then trying to solve it again. That's what it feels <laughs> like when, you, when you're constantly tinkering. Like To me, having some sort of uh, comfort fallback, and there there are decks that I, I think I've done this with. My, my Omnath Locus of Rage deck for sure is a, a comfort deck for me where... I know how it performs. I know what it does. And if I change one card a year, that's that's a lot. Having something like that, that I, I enjoy kind of knowing what I'm going to come back to with a deck. But there are absolutely decks that uh, the tinkering is still part of me figuring out the process and figuring out what do I want the deck to look like. Uh, my Shanid deck, my Mardu Legends deck. That one is one I, I played with you guys probably several times when we last saw each other in person. Mm -hmm. I can't get that deck right. And that very much is a tinkering just to get it to kind of a solved state even. And I, I honestly don't know if that deck ever is going to be where I want it to be. 
I, I very much like the challenge, and I, I think the main reason why I do is because you know a couple of my my earliest decks when I first started playing are probably my most straightforward decks. I, I still have my Talran Sky Summoner deck together, and while I probably wouldn't build it today necessarily, um, if I did, it like wouldn't look much different. That 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 deck. There's not a lot of avenues to explore that aren't pretty obvious on the card. I, I ran a Sagarda Host of Hurons um, Enchantress deck for a lot of years. There was never much to unlock with that deck, no matter how many cards I swapped in or out. It played exactly like I knew it was going to play in the first day I built it. Hmm. Whereas the 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 little more Baroque decks I, I have have built, you know, in recent years that I've tried to um, figure out how they worked and had to tinker with and had to like put in effort to to get the pieces to work the way I want to. Those are the ones where I found things. I found play paths in the deck or build styles in the deck that I that that weren't readily apparent when I was first brainstorming the idea. So that's one of the things I like about challenging decks is they leave a lot of room for discovery, yeah. at least for me in the way I brew, in a way that a more straightforward deck doesn't. Yeah, no, like I'll, I'll to use an example of a character from uh, Lorehold from, from Strixhaven, Quintorius Field Historian versus the new Quintorius Lore Master, I think is a really good example of this. And granted, there's a lot of time difference between those two, but Quintorius Field Historian, which is older, um, it does have about double the number of decks as the new Quintorius. Again, though, the new Quintorius, very, very new. But for me, looking at the two of them side by side, Quintorius Field Historian does not enable its own ability. It says whenever one or more cards leave your graveyard you create a 3-2 white creature spirit token and that sounds really really cool like oh yeah the, what is the challenge of this how do i make that happen multiple times per turn the commander's not doing it for you whereas quintoria's lore master the new one it's got a lot of text on it and it's doing a bunch of stuff but one of those abilities is to kind of enable its own thing where it is doing its own exile target non-creature non-land card from your graveyard and then you create tokens that way and it can also sacrifice spirits to do even more stuff with the whatever you've already exiled and i'm like one of those feels a little bit more self-contained and the original field historian that that's the one that feels to me like it's actually going to present a, a challenge and that will feel a little bit different every single game and that therefore makes it a little bit more engaging to me sorry matt i know we're not talking about lord of the rings but i thought that those two characters at different points in the timeline would be very illustrative of the challenge question that you asked <laughs> uh no it's it's fine i i get it um we can't give all of our attention to lord of the rings eventually we're gonna have to give our attention to power rangers and that's cool um <laughs> Maybe battle bots in the future too. We we already had transformers. Not a far stretch there. <laughs> but I, I'm sure when, when we eventually get those cards, there'll be plenty of stats to challenge. Oh, Ooh, no. there will be. Duh. Challenge challenge the secret layer stats. Honestly, I should have seen that one coming. On that's on me. <laughs> that I should have been able to you grab said the that word one. Challenge like nine times in your bed. I, I was waiting for for you to just get the, up underneath us. Because he was asking about, oh, do you like a challenge? <laughs> I should that. Wow. Yeah. I. <laughs> you know what, Dana? I like a challenge. A challenge. The stats. <laughs> <laughs> it was right there, Joey. It was. That was the lowest hanging fruit, and I just yeah. completely did not <laughs> think of it. I was too busy thinking about this elephant Quintorius guy, but. <laughs> All right, fair play. Well, the, the real elephant in the room is why didn't you segue? <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and challenge some stats. We'll be right back after this quick break. Well, the first challenge we have this week was sent to us by listener Drew D. Um, and it is for the relatively new card, Leyline Immersion from uh, March of the Machine Aftermath. Leyline Immersion is a three and a green uh, enchant a legendary creature. Enchanted Creature has Ward 2 and Tap and add 5 mana in any combination of colors and spend this mana only to cast spells. Um, currently, Leyline Immersion, Immersion is in just under 2% of Joda Archmage Eternal decks. Ha! And the the um, point that Drew makes is if Joda's allowed to stick, it's not because people don't have removal for Joda. <laughs> and Joda's never going to be attacking anyway, so... Um, Leyland Immersion is not going to paint a target on Joda that doesn't already exist. It's going to give you a little bit of protection anyway, and it's going to let your commander that probably isn't going to be doing much but allowing you to cast giant spells to cast even gianter spells. <laughs> um, I think that's actually a pretty good point. I think that probably applies to more than just Joda. I think there's quite a few commanders out there that have a giant bullseye painted on them, and they're not going to be attacking because of what they do is not an attack-based thing, so... 
Um, if they're going to stick, there's there's nothing that you're going to do that's going to make people want to remove them more than what they're already doing. You might as well get some extra utility out of them and tapping them for five mana is a pretty good bit of utility while also adding ward. Um, yeah, I think Lightland Immersion is a pretty solid card in quite a few decks and I'm, I'm down for you attaching it to Joda and making that degenerate commander even more degenerate. I'm way into that. That's an excellent challenge. Thank you so much, Drew. Uh, all right, I'll move to my challenge here. And there's early data yet on the commanders from Lord of the Rings, but there is a certain thing showing up in some of the Bilbo birthday celebrant decks that I'm a little bit critical of. So I'd like to use the moment to talk about that. Bilbo birthday celebrant is from the new Food and Fellowship pre-constructed deck. It's the Obzon commander, a halfling rogue, three mana, two, three. If you would gain life, you gain that much life plus one and instead and if you are at bilbo's 111st birthday aka if you have 111 or more life you can activate this great big ability to pay five mana make bilbo disappear and then a whole bunch of stuff from your deck will go just slam straight into play. It's a very, very cool commander, but there's a card that's showing up in 37% of the almost 500 Bilbo decks we have in the database so far that I don't think really does the deed very well. That's Cosmos Elixir, four mana artifact. At the beginning of your end step, draw a card if your life total is greater than your starting life total. Otherwise, you gain two life. Um, it, in in like a mono white life gain deck, I get need in the extra card draw, but this is a four mana card that does not always draw you things and does not always gain you life and this is not a mono white deck <laughs> this is an obs on deck and when i think of green and black drawing cards there are there are so many ways to draw cards <laughs> and i just think that they are there are there are better uses of your mana there are faster ways to draw some cards even if you are trying to reach that 111st mark with bilbo's activated ability Casting a Night's Whisper just feels so much better than waiting a whole lot of time for Cosmos Elixir. So I'm going to give a challenge to this one. I don't think that this is very, very good. And if you use a lot of the like green creature based draw instead, I think that's going to serve you a whole, whole lot better than this one will. So that is my challenge. Yeah, I, I am with you on this one, Joey. And, and this isn't even a card I don't think where you can be like, well, it's not maybe that good, but it's super fun. I don't even think there's anything particularly fun about it. It's just, <laughs> it's just a kind of suboptimal card for that deck in colors that have a bunch of much better options. Well, I'll, I'll wrap us up then. So um, I my, my my challenge, actually, uh, a fan brought this up to us. So um, a, a Dana Roach on Twitter, uh, some of you probably know them, uh, shared a picture recently of a pretty devastating detention sphere that happened recently. So, so Dana Roach out there, uh, I hope you're, you're enjoying the shout out that you're getting here. Sounds like a fantastic commander player. Pro probably a very <laughs> handsome person too. But anyways, so the, the picture was detention sphere hitting four soul rings and it's kind of a, a crazy thing to think about. But when you zoom out and think about all of the tokens that are out there, all the different kinds of tokens, how easy it is to make people talk about treasures, but also now that there's a lot of food tokens going around, but also just everything, there, there's a lot of homogeneity going around in the format. So Detention Sphere being able to take out a lot of those things all at once, I think the value of this card has gone up a lot over the past few years where it wasn't really played a whole lot. So Detention Sphere is one, a blue and a white for an enchantment that says when D Detention Sphere enters the battlefield, you may exile target non-land permanent, not named Detention Sphere, and all of their permanents with the same name as that permanent. And then when Detention Sphere leaves the battlefield, return the exiled cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. So you can cast this on your own permanent. That way, if you're targeting a token, if you have somebody that's just playing a treasures deck and, and they have 20 out there, well, if you cast it targeting somebody else's, they can just sacrifice the response. Detention Sphere doesn't do anything, but if you target your own mm. treasure, you're able to then take everything out or they have to sacrifice everything in response. There's a lot of tricks that you can do and it's always fun. It's kind of when you realize, oh, I can cast this Berserk or on somebody else's creature. Well, I can cast a Detention Sphere on my own thing and then get rid of all of my opponent's things because they can't sacrifice them in response. Detention Sphere is barely in 10,000 decks as of now. And, and that's, I, I just think the value of this card has, has gotten higher over the years where there's more permanents with the same names any, all around these days. Uh, it's, it's kind of the reverse. Typically, we see cards from this era kind of aging out because we're getting better versions of these. I think Detention Sphere and a couple of the other variants, those are still very, very good. So I, I would give a second look if you're playing it. It's only in 2% of eligible Azorius decks. So if you're looking for a, a good way to get rid of a massive amount of tokens, this is one way to do it. 
the the tokens especially and, and like it's not just like you named a lot of artifact tokens there but mm -hmm. i mean last time i played against you how many sapperlings were there <laughs> uh, yeah. last time that i played uh, how many zombies did i make <laughs> and not only that but there are also a lot of tokens that are different but they share the same name so like i mentioned quintorius earlier which makes three two red and white spirits but if you're up against a quintorius deck and a thalese deck well the thalese makes one one white flying spirits they're still named spirit you're going to hit all of them yep. because they share yep. the same name. <laughs> and so like that that's also a pretty interesting thing. In addition to this, sometimes just being good at getting rid of a single individual thing that you need to just have it temporarily be be removed from. Um, yeah, no, I, I would agree with your estimation there that like the tokening of the format is getting very, very big. So a card that can wipe out a bunch of tokens all at once is a pretty nice safety blanket compared to where it used to be. Yeah, well, well thanks to Dana Roach, wherever you are out there. Uh, thank you for sharing that picture of this very, very good detention sphere. Uh, I, I don't know, that Dana, it sounds, it sounds kind of sketchy. Sound, sounds like a real piece of work, that one. All right, guys, let's get back to our topic here, talking about the things that make a commander compelling. And we've covered a couple of pretty obvious bases, I think. Like if there's a commander that's doing something in new colors or if it's doing something that we haven't yet seen before. Um, Dana, a thing for you is definitely like the uniqueness. Is this allowing a very specific set of self-expression that you're not going to see just anywhere? Those are really cool things as well. Another factor that I tend to notice is playing a really, really big role in my decision making about whether or not I'm going to commit to a new commander, and I want to hear if this resonates with you guys, is whether or not it's winning in basically a new way. Um, <laughs> like if I have one, like, like actually, no, I, I literally did. I had a black white tokens deck, which was Thalese. And then I also had Martin Stromgald for a while. And that was also a tokens deck. And they both won by pumping up a bunch of tokens and attacking. And eventually I took one of those decks apart because they both felt, even though they were in different colors, they both played almost exactly the same way. And so I'm wondering for y'all, is that a factor that plays into like whether a commander catches your eye? You, you look at it and you're like, ooh, this lets me win in a way that is different than what I've currently got. Or is that not a thing that you care about at all? I, I would say so. I kind of had the the same experience, only the inverse of it, where you had two decks that were basically trying to do the same thing. I had a deck that was trying to do something, and then the commander came out that kind of did it. So it's kind of a repeat of, of the Tom Bombadil effect, where I was playing Moldrotha plus one plus one counters. And it wasn't, it was fine, but I just, I wanted to do the strategy in these colors. And, and I never really had a chance to, but then Ukima and Kazir came out and it really actually let me do the thing. Mm. Um, so I was able to, to win the way that I wanted to in those colors. So it's not that I had two decks in different colors doing the same thing, but I had a deck in colors that it, it wanted to do the thing, but it couldn't really do it that well. And so I know you, I'm, I'm kind of answering the question reverse, but <laughs> it, that's kind of my most recent experience where I really wanted a plus one, plus one counters deck in Sultai colors because we had Golgari that could do it. We had Simic that could do it, but we didn't have Sultai that could do it. And so when I finally had the chance to do that, I was, I was very excited. I was, uh, yes, this is great. This is what I want to be doing and the colors I want to be doing. I'm going to jump into this commander right there. No, yeah, yeah. The, finding a way to make deck uh, the decks not just different from what someone else is playing and in the pod or the shop or the, the adventure at, but finding them to play different from the decks I already have too is very important to me when I brew. And, and it's increasingly more and more difficult the more decks you have too. Mm. Um, you know, when if you've got three decks, it's pretty easy to make a fourth that doesn't overlap too much with the decks you have. When you've got, you know, a dozen um, or 15 or 30 or 50, like, you know, some people have, that becomes really challenging to find unique ways to to make them play and make them win. Um, but but I, I'm always trying to do it, um, finding trying to find ways to differentiate deck A from deck B. Um, and, and one thing that does, I, I think, makes that a little bit easier in my case is when I'm looking for something like, if I'm going to brew an Arwen Modular deck, that's probably going to play different than most of the other decks I have just because nothing's going to quite look like that. Um, so that, that is going to naturally probably give give me some some reasons to brew that deck in a way that doesn't overlap with other decks I have be because it's such kind of an odd thing. But yeah, it's that's a very much an important thing for me when it comes to a commander catching my eye is is me looking at it and thinking not only can I do something unique with it, but can the thing I do not overlap with what I already have? So so Dana, you're saying you don't want every black deck to have Mirkwood bats and Orcish bowmasters? <laughs> is that I, what you're? I, I don't. That doesn't that doesn't compute. Yeah, you mean you don't like winning with Gray Merchant of Asphodel all the dang time? What? And, and and don't get me wrong, like we're we're kind of joking about that, but like. I understand why someone was just like, I'm just going to throw Crater Hoof and Overrun into my green deck. 
because maybe you don't find the process of brewing interesting, or maybe you don't find like having a particular unique win con interesting. Like if that, if that doesn't speak to you, I don't want, I don't want you to feel like I am like disrespectful to the way you build or brew or play. Um, I, I get to why some people don't care about those things. Um, I'm just someone who does. Like for me personally, that's that, that I'm about trying to find that unique way to do it. But if that's not important to you, don't feel bad about that. Well, well. So in defense of the those players, because I, I have Crater Hoof in a couple decks, sure. And that's my okay. Well, if if all else fails, I still have a Crater Hoof. Uh, so like, I, I understand not wanting to win that way, but sometimes having a, a safe backup plan that's that's the reason I put them into decks, and it's it's not ever the the primary way, but that I want to win. But a win is a win, and and I know some people find winning a certain way more satisfying than others, and that that's cool. So to kind of push back and give the the contrast to your statement, sometimes I have my primary goal in mind. Sure. But sometimes, okay, well, if I just like crater hoof, like I I can't think of another card. I just have this crater hoof here. Let's just throw that in there. Yeah. Sometimes that's just how some of those cards end up in in my decks, at least, and so. I don't think it's so much putting it in there because, well, I, I don't want to do any more research, but sometimes it's just, well, I have this here. Uh, it's kind of the, the next best thing if my primary win condition fails. And so I, I, I'm well, not going to fault it, anybody for, for the, the crater hoof inclusions. Sure. And don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't mean that as a bad thing. Like sometimes if that's not fun for you, why should you do it? Like if, if, you, if, if digging up obscure win conditions or something isn't something that's enjoyable for you, and you just want to put your crater hoof in. I, I don't. That's not a negative thing. Like there, there's no point in playing a game if you have to do things that aren't fun, right? So like I, I don't mean that in a bad way for sure. Yeah, I, I don't want to have to decipher what Simulacrum actually does. Sure, unlike right. you, <laughs> unlike yeah, no, you do. Fair, so uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and he's not talking about Solemn Simulacrum. Every time that card no. comes up, <laughs> we need to yeah. clarify. We're talking about a card whose current actual paper printing does not do what the card actually does because of very heavy errata on that thing, which is very very funny. But yeah, no, the the I can absolutely understand why some of those looking for the niche corner case things. Some of those are just like confusing and weird and not enjoyable because you like you'd rather actually like, play the dang game as opposed to thinking about play the dang game um yeah but th th yeah I, I find that this the, the way that a deck wins matters quite a lot to me in the the deck building journeys that i go on these days uh i remember when jetmere nexus of revels came out for example the uh not no not nadania the cabaretti uh cat demon from new capenna that gives a huge enormous game winning pump if you have a certain number of creatures in play and i did a bit of testing with that for one of the upping the average videos that i did and it, it really didn't speak to me like the the game plan i it was it felt like all right here's what you do this is cool i'm i don't mean this as a, a knock against the deck but for me it was not it was not speaking to me and not just because it didn't have like golgari colors in it which you know i i love i love playing me some necromancy that's not the reason the reason was because it would very much the play pattern was something i knew from the time that i shuffled up that i was like oh the win condition is right there in the command zone so every time i win it's going to look pretty similar to all of the other times that i win and i enjoy a little bit more variation and that that was the kind of thing when I was looking at that commander deciding, oh, will I build anything? That knocked that commander down very, very far on my personal estimation. And I just, you know, was was curious whether the the way that a deck wins is a factor that y'all consider as well, because it really, really is for me. I like a deck to win a little bit differently than my other decks. And I also like the deck to be able to win not just in a single way every single game. It, it feels a little bit like the Primal Surge situation. Like once you've cast a Primal Surge one time, it sort of feels like, okay, I'm good. And you might not always feel like, oh, I got to keep doing that every time because you've had the experience once. Um, I, I don't know. I think I'm just rambling at this point, but that's that's a big factor for me is all I'm trying to say. No, I, I think that's a, that's a perfect example. Primal Surge is a perfect example of that. And again, maybe not everyone feels that way, but I, I very much do, right? I want that. I want to, to not just be playing towards that one single point. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, to, to step out of our wheelhouse for a moment, there's a lot of CDH decks that are playing towards that single point, that single win condition. But, but in those cases, the, the game they are playing is happening like, mm -hmm. uh, at a different point. It's a, it's, it's about like fighting to get to that point where you can play, get, get to that win condition. Right. Right. So it's, it's like a different deal there. Um, and I understand why they're building to whatever that optimal win condition is. Whereas, like the the power level I play at, I just want to have different 
different branches I can choose at the end versus different branches I can choose to get to the same end. I, I like that distinction a lot. I'm very much like, oh, I don't know what the destination is going to be when I go on when I start a game. I'm like, oh, well, I'll leave the destination up to, to chance. It'll be interesting. Whereas like the more competitive end of the format is going to be, oh, we know the destination. It's about how we get there. And that's a very good uh, type of distinction for sure. Yeah, just for the decision tree, instead of, you know, you, you start from the beginning and you branch up from there, it's you have many branches leading to the same endpoint. So, yeah, th that is a very, very important distinction. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really I like that and, and appreciate just kind of having that brow because that, that is a good way to think about it. And, and maybe it's just something that I didn't really have the the right analogy or, or words to put to something that I've, I've thought about before too is do I want to have the starting point and then have a, a variety of different wind conditions or do I want to have a variety of different ways to get that to that wind condition? So that that is a really, really good way to narrate that point. As a potential topic shift, uh, this is this is kind of weird. Um, but, you know, in looking through the Lord of the Rings commanders, there are some where I'm, yeah, I'm looking at those. And I'm like, I totally get the like the new Aragorn, the Uniter. Like that one, I think, falls into the same camp, Dana, that you were talking about earlier. Where like you could build this as like all charms and a bunch of multicolor or you could build it as like just an all Lord of the Rings like deck unto itself. Because so many of these cool creatures are multicolored. Like that's going to have so many payoffs or when you cast a white spell, do this. When you cast a blue spell, do this. When you cast like that's going to be really cool. I see that and I'm like, all right. That's a lot of abilities, but I, I get it. And then I look at the commander next to it, which is Sauron the Dark Lord. And I want to know from you guys, when you feel like you can't mentally keep up with a commander, does that also factor in? Because I have read this card so many times and it just keeps going and I cannot grok it in my brain. Like, what is this card? Yeah, it's not that there's just it's it's a lot of words on one ability and it's a very complex thing. Like it, the cards from Strixhaven were very much that way. This has four different abilities that you have to keep tracking. So it's not so much there's, okay, it does this one thing and there's just a lot of words to explain it. No, it has four different abilities that make the lots of words that explain what it does. And that I totally get the the mental exhaustion trying to track all the things. Uh, the Great Henge. I forget that the Great Henge does all the things that it does. Right. <laughs> and I play, I play them like four decks. Uh yeah, we joke about that all the time. The questing beast. How many things does questing beast do? Nobody really knows. Yes. Oh, but yeah, yeah. And, and Sauron's like, Ward, you have to sacrifice legendary creatures or artifacts to target me. Whenever your opponents cast spell, you amass a bunch of stuff. Whenever you hit someone with an army, the ring tempts you. And whenever the ring tempts you, you can draw extra stuff. I'm just like this. I didn't want a flowchart. I wanted a commander. Or or the, the other one, uh, the Sauron of many colors. This one, I also just have difficulty understanding what it's doing. I, I feel like the wording on this one is so much. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, each opponent mills two cards. When one or more cards are milled this way, exile target enchantment instant or sorcery card with equal or lesser mana value than that spell from an opponent's graveyard copy the exiled card you may cast the copy without paying his mana cost and it also has words i'm just like these some of these are a bit much for me matt this is my strixhaven moment <laughs> like yeah the strixhaven was too many words for you and that that is a thing for me a lot of this set has washed over me because i feel like i cannot keep up these commanders will be smarter than me and i don't want to embarrass myself if i try to build them <laughs> there's there's definitely a couple of them that i'm like i'm sure it said something about putting stickers on that card somewhere and all that <laughs> <laughs> but I can't seem to find it again. So yeah, no, there's I I absolutely get that vibe where because because the, the, the Soren Dark Lord is a great example. It's a really powerful card, but I look at it, I'm like, it's doing so many disparate things that I don't know how you would build it other than just a really good card with a bunch of really good cards in the deck. Like its suggestion to me is just beat face, um, and, and that isn't particularly interesting to me because um, it's it, it's it's an example. You know, a deck can be too narrow for for to be appealing to me in the case of maybe Tom Bombadil, that can be too broad in in this case too, where there's so many different things that I don't know how it would, mm. how it would pick a strategy for it. Yeah. I just know that if I were to build this, I would miss so many triggers. I would miss so, oh, yeah. Yeah. so <laughs> yeah. many triggers. And I'm just like, you know what? I think I should just be graceful with myself and not yes. open myself yep. up to that risk. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I, I miss the, the moments of simple elegance in, in card design, especially when it comes to legendaries. Like, yeah, you have to go down quite a quite a ways if you look at the top commanders from the set to kind of get a, a simple and elegant design. And Lotho Corrupt Sheriff is that. It's the uh, black and white. Uh, whenever a player casts their second spell each turn, you lose a life and create a treasure token. That's it. One ability. There it is. Yeah. And half the light, half the half the text on the card is either flavor text or reminder text of what a treasure is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as one more question for y'all, and I think the food and fellowship precon is also a really good illustration of this potential thing. Um, 
Do you think that you are more drawn to a commander that is an engine for the deck or a commander that is a payoff for the deck? And I mentioned the food and fellowship because there's the partner pair of Sam and Frodo, which can give you foods and draw you cards. And there's also the other optional pair there, which is Merry and Pippin, which can give you foods and soldier tokens and can actually be your win condition. And I feel like one of those is very much an engine for the deck. We're supplying food, we're supplying some card advantage for you, and it's nice and simple, but it doesn't like those commanders are not themselves going to be the way you win whereas the other pair is like oh let's actually give a win condition to this deck it's right there in the command zone like matt is there one of those that you think would speak to you more than the other do you prefer engines or payoffs in your command zone do you think oh it's a good question because i i really have kind of split between the two when it comes to all when i think about all of my decks because i i mean like we have my alila soon to be tom bombadil that's kind of the, let me, it really is payoff and engine there uh, once it's getting transformed. But it was uh, the payoff for the sagas when it was Alila because I was getting all of those 1-1s. One I was getting that massive army of fairies to, to turn an attack. But in my Tristani deck, which is my Selesnya Panharmonicon deck, it really isn't a payoff because it just kind of buffs everything a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's more... It's hard to say there. I, I'm really split. Uh, my Raga Draga deck, it empowers what I'm already doing. So that's kind of more of a payoff, I would say. Um, but also it also makes my cards relevant in that deck because it's Eldrazi Scions and that's hard to make relevant. <laughs> so I go back and forth. It's really, really hard to say. It's just kind of whatever I'm feeling the need for or, or kind of how the, the commander is doing whether it is the payoff or the engine, that's it's a really hard thing for me to to put a number down because my decks are pretty split on both of those. Yeah, yeah, because you've got Omnath, which is like he's not giving you any lands, but if you play lands, then he'll be like, all right, cool. So like, yeah, you've you've got a very big a spread there for sure. So mm -hmm. I mean, of those two potential partner things, is there one that speaks to you more? Do you think, or is food not your jam? Food is not my jam. I I'm not super excited for it, so I would probably go away from the food theme there. And Dana, how about you, engine or payoff? I don't necessarily have a preference um, as long as the the commander is going to work with whatever the strategy I have decided in advance is. It doesn't particularly matter to me. It will affect how I build the deck. Um, if, if the commander's the the payoff, then maybe I need to focus on win conditions a little bit less in the deck. If the commander's you know an engine or something, then maybe I need to have a few less engines in the deck. So like at the end of the day, it will probably shape the final. Um, version of the deck and how it looks and with regards to what cards are in it but i don't really have a preference it's going to matter to me way more that it's that it's facilitating the strategy that i want to to be using versus you know whether it's doing a super powerful thing necessarily well joey how about you do you, do you prefer the payoff or the engines to, to be in your command zone. I'm pretty solidly an engine type of guy, I think. Like, I mean, I, I, I try not to mention her every episode, but like there's a reason Baba La Saga is my favorite commander ever. It's because like she's doing the thing. She is drawing the cards. She is providing like the, the fuel for the rest of the deck to keep going. And I just, I really, really enjoy that. Or Will Helt is another example of like, Will Helt is supplying me with cards. And I think that keeps the rest of the deck. It greases the wheels of the rest of the deck. And I really enjoy that as long as it's not like going way, way too far. And like, I still get to do the thing that I want to do. And it's not like I'm so focused on like the drawing of the cards that that takes me away from the actual point of the deck. Like Will Helt Zombie, draw effect is capped very very solidly and that keeps me focused on zombies rather than focused on drawing cards so i like an engine that knows not to go overboard um so th those tend to be but you know i've also got conrad and conrad is absolutely like the rest of the deck needs to support that person right there so I, I certainly do have both but i am way 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 more drawn to an engine in the command zone personally and i think that that does tend to also kind of show out for like the data that we get on EDH rec as well because like of those partner pairs that I mentioned of Sam and Frodo versus Merry and Pippin Sam and Frodo are currently the ones in the lead maybe that will change over time who knows uh but I I think that having a nice little extra way to get a little bit more greasing of the wheels to get a little extra card advantage to help make sure the deck is never stuck top decking is very very appealing and so that's another thing that I tend to notice when it, I'm like hmm what might I build? That That's another detail that really, really sticks out to me. Well, Matt and I touched on commanders that we are considering building, at least from the set. Has anything caught your eye so far, Joey? Uh, the, the next commander I'm going to build is is what you're asking? Um, yeah. You're not going to like the answer. It's Tyvar the Bellicose. <laughs> it's not from the Lord of the Rings at all. Um, and... <laughs> 
I, I, I'm not trying to deviate from the subject. I, I promise. The Lord of the Rings stuff has been a little bit overwhelming for me. There's so many. There's like, what, 130 something new legends or whatever. And that, that's kind of a lot. Whereas like this, this little fella, Tyvar, who pumps up your stuff whenever you resolve mana abilities. I was like, oh. That that that's a little bit new, and I already have so many of these elf cards just sitting right here, um, and I'm I'm just kind of really intrigued by the idea of like tapping a Viridian Joiner, which gives you mana equal to its power, like tapping it for one, and the next turn you tap it for two, and then you tap it for four, and then for eight, and that keeps going, and. So, I mean, yeah, uh, it's a, a card from a set that a lot of people overlooked. It's a slightly new take on an old standby, a lot of elf and mana dork stuff. I, I like the colors. Let's just be honest about that. I have a proclivity for Golgari. Um, and the, the ability is simple, <laughs> which apparently matters a lot for me. Um, so, yeah, I think that this is the type of commander that would give me some of those happy broken giggles. Um, and, and that's kind of taken up more of my attention than any of the Lord of the Rings stuff. So I'm sorry. I think I'm failing at your question. No, well, I, I will say this while you have indeed failed at my question. Um, I understand <laughs> why. I, I, I tend to be someone who, who, who needs to have a commander sit and stew for a while, too. So it's it's unusual that I had an answer. Yeah. Very often I would be in the same boat you are where I'm like, well, I built a thing from Khans of Tarkir. That's kind of standing out to me. <laughs> Um, so no, I, I very much get where you're coming from. Well, and it's funny too, because really March the Machine Aftermath, that should 100% be Dana's favorite set because nobody even knows that these commanders are things. <laughs> right. I didn't even know the set came out and apparently there's 21 commanders in that set as well. So mm -hmm. I'm surprised, Dana, you haven't looked at more because this, I mean, really the set was just overshadowed because there was so much going on. This was kind of set in between March of the Machine and Lord of the Rings which are two absolutely massive sets, probably two of the biggest sets, honestly, probably two of the biggest sets in the past five years, maybe 10, mm. probably since I came back. It, people have just been so hyped about these two sets. Everything's been building up towards these. So March the Machine really has been forgotten. So thank you for the reminder this set exists, Joey, because <laughs> I, I I feel bad, but like I honestly didn't really remember. I'll be giving it a long look around 2024, probably. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know what? And that actually, I th th this is an interesting thing, Dana. I am taking on more of your role where I'm building a thing from a, a set that is actually past, and you're actually building something from the new set, which is yes, more of right. a me type of move. So uh, we're, we're switching some spots, and that's very, very interesting. I'm going to have to keep an eye on that tendency. <laughs> Next thing you know, you'll be uh, stealing the challenge of stats from us. I, I yep. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'll be posting stuff about detention spheres on the online as there well. We go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this is very interesting, guys. Uh, it, it was nice to pick your brains about the type of stuff that makes a commander jump out to you because, yeah, there are hundreds of new legendary designs all the time with all of these sets. So it's nice to have an idea of like, what am I looking for? And sometimes you don't know it until you see it. And it's nice to try and reverse engineer what's going on in our heads to see what what are the reasons that I'm drawn to certain commanders over others, because there's a lot to choose from out there. And it's nice to find those diamonds in the rough and to explore what you enjoy about exploring. So this is a really fun one. But with that, I think we should call this episode to a close. So fellas, where can our listeners find us if they want to get a hold of us? Matt? So you can find me on the Twitter at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. Don't forget we are streaming over at twitch.tv slash EDH Ratcast Wednesday evenings. We have guests on every time we stream as well. It's always a super fun time, so tune into that. And Dana. You can find me on Twitter at Dana Roach. I'm writing articles for EDH Rec, and you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDH Recast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz, and you can find the cast at EDH Recast on all of the online places as well. Plus, if you've got a question for us, you can contact us at EDH Recast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for assisting me with the post-production of the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. Listeners, we would love to hear from you about what you think makes Commanders most compelling to you, and we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights, but until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. <laughs>